Today I'll be reading from Joshua 24, 14 and 15. It'll be out of the New King James Version. Now therefore fear the Lord, serve him in all sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you dwell. But for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The importance of a godly Christian home cannot be overstated. And in order to have godly and Christian homes, we need some faithful fathers somewhere. And if we don't have faithful fathers in the Lord's church, what do we have? Well, not much of anything at all. Do you remember living at home? Remember how terrible it was? It was terrible, wasn't it? Wasn't it awful? Your daddy was so strict, told you what time to get up, told you what time to go to bed, told you to eat what was put in front of your face, told you to get in there and pick that up, told you to get out there and wash that car. Didn't he? Well, let me tell you, when you get as old as me, you'll have figured out you need to be thankful for your father. You need to be thankful if you had a strict father. All the people who I've ever met in my life that hate their fathers, their daddies let them do whatever they wanted to do. Their daddies turned them loose and said, go on. You can stay out all night. You can do this. You can do that. And they got in terrible, terrible, sinful trouble. Fathers are often the first line of defense in protecting their children from sin. Do you realize that's your responsibility? Not to enable your children to sin, fathers, but to protect them, to help keep them pure, to help keep them chaste, C-H-A-S-T-E, not running around with a bunch of boys or running after a bunch of girls, keeping them safe. It is possible that the single most important thing in everyone's life is your father. Now, your mother may influence you more than dad, but it takes a dad. It takes a father to balance out that home. Do we have faithful fathers anywhere? Are there any faithful fathers left? If you didn't know, it's Father's Day. If you're a father, happy Father's Day. If you're not a father, it's still a great day to be alive. Today's sermon we choose to entitle Faithful Fathers. And though we are going to address fathers specifically, these principles apply to all. What we're going to do today, today's sermon is going to be an acrostic. Started to do mother that way, but I got tickled. So we'll, we'll try to be a little bit more serious with fathers. F-A-T-H-E-R. Six points. So point number one, start with F. Point number two, A, and on down the line. Is that all right? That's all right. Let's go ahead and get started. F, in the word father, number one, forbearing. Big word, but I think it's pretty simple meaning. Let's turn to the book of Ephesians. We'll look at one section of scripture for each letter. We'll be done. And hopefully this will stick. Hopefully this will do what it's designed to do. We need faithful fathers. Faithful fathers must in the first place be forbearing. Accepting pains and hardships without complaint. If dad is the one who complains all the time, the home's not right. Well, somebody's got to step up and bear that load. The book of Ephesians shows the glorious and exalted nature of the New Testament church. The New Testament church is the church of Christ. 
Romans 16. The church has been paid for with Christ's blood, Acts 20, 28. Now, the first part of the book of Ephesians, in my judgment, is doctrinal. That is truth. First three chapters. The last three chapters, 4, 5, and 6, are practical or life. And chapter 4 here, verses 1 through 3, chapter 4 is about unity. Do our homes need to have unity? I think so. Then faithful fathers are going to have to be forbearing. Forbearance is an intensified form of long suffering. It's not simply or merely toleration. There are some people who can tolerate a lot. That's not it. Unity is desired. Long suffering. Bear with your family and help them, men. Ephesians 4 and verse number 1. I therefore, Paul the Apostle, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech, I beg you, that you walk worthy of the vocation, the work wherewith you are called. How? With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering. Yes, this is in the church, but should it not be in the home? Forbearing. Suffering long, an intensified form of long suffering. Forbearing one another, how? In love, endeavoring, striving to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond, in the glue of peace. Do you want your home to fall apart, fathers? You want it to fall apart and crumble and be nothing? Have reprobate children, an unfaithful wife? Is that what you want? You need to forbear with your family. That does not mean tolerate. You help them. You work with them. Do you see that? Yes. This scripture is in regard to the church. There is that practical application, but you can also look at it in the home. Does a faithful father need to practice forbearance? Amen. He must, a faithful father must be forbearing. Suffer long. If dad's a hothead, look out. Look out. It's going to be rough. Faithful fathers must always seek to unite their families by means of forbearance. A forbearing man is a forgiving man. Did you hear that? A forbearing man is a forgiving man. All of us could run straight down the line and do what is just. We need mercy. A forbearing father is necessary in order to be a faithful father. We must all work through the bad and grow in love. Number one in our acrostic for father is forbearing. You must suffer long intensely. Work with your family. Help them. Guide them. Don't write them off and be done with them too quickly. F, forbearing. Number two. We need a faithful father to be attentive. Do I have your attention? Faithful fathers must be attentive. You must learn to pick up on the subtleties in your family. When your wife gives you that look, and yet that look, you need to know when to back down. When your children look sad, when they've had a bad day, you got to pick up on that. You have to see it. You have to be attentive. Attentive means able to concentrate and to fix the mind upon someone or something. Sometimes we get so busy we're focused on everything in the world but our family. Let's go to the book of James. Book of James, chapter 1. Let's get a principle here. Book of James is probably the most practical book of the Bible. Well, what do you mean by that? I mean of any book of the Bible that you could just sit down and read and grasp and understand, James is it. You don't necessarily have to have a lot of background information. You don't have to have a lot of history. You sit down and read and you take it for what it says and put it to use. That's the book of James. You don't have to, now it's good to study it, but we have to understand the Bible is designed to be understood. James chapter 1 shows that the faith that pleases God is the faith that endures trials. Let's look at James 1, verses 19 and 20. What are we talking about? 
We're talking about faithful fathers. Faithful fathers must be attentive. There are times you need to listen. There are times you need to be quiet and listen. Wherefore, conclusion based on evidence, my beloved brethren, let every man, every man be what? Swift to hear. How can you be swift to hear when you're not attentive? When you're too busy, worried about what's going on at work, too busy about worrying how I'm going to pay these bills. You need to be concerned about what's happening to the souls of my family. Be attentive, swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Why? For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Faithful fathers must always be ready to give their children and their wives Practical advice for living and existing in this life. Much more so even the spiritual things. Practical advice can only be given by a father who is attentive. Who's there. Who's involved. Who's engaged. Are we so busy, fathers, that we're not attentive? That we don't listen that we don't pick up on the subtleties? God forbid. Why? We have to be faithful fathers. Faithful father, F is forbearing. A faithful father, A is attentive. A faithful father, T is trustworthy. Let's go to the book of 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians, we'll look at 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse number 4. And by the word trustworthy, we mean full of trust. Well, what is trust? Trust is confidence or faith. Have we lived in such a way that our wives know that we're worthy of trust? That we're trustworthy? Have we lived in such a way that our children know, even if they're adults, that we're trustworthy? I certainly hope so. The book of 1 Thessalonians corrects some first century and obviously present day misconceptions regarding the return of Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians is very possibly the first book of the New Testament that was written, that was actually recorded, inspired by the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul wrote it. It's possibly the very first book of the New Testament. Now let's look at 1 Thessalonians 2. And verse number four, and listen to this. You realize, fathers, you have been put in trust of a wife. And if God has blessed you, put you in trust of children. Do you realize you are responsible for them? First Thessalonians 2, 4. Listen to what Paul was entrusted with. But as we were allowed of God to be put in, in trust. With what in this context? With the gospel. If you can't trust a man to help raise his family, what could you trust him with? If, you, if a man cannot be trusted with his wife, trusted with his wife to help and encourage her, what's he going to do when children come? In? What's he going to do when the children arrive? It's going to be a mess. Paul and the other apostles and inspired men were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel. Even so we speak, not as pleasing men. It's hard to be a father, let me tell you. It's hard to be a husband. It's hard to be a man. Don't you realize it's difficult to be a human being? It's difficult, but it's not impossible. Are we trustworthy? Do our families have absolute confidence and trust in us? If not, why not? Paul could be trusted with the gospel. What can you be trusted with, men? Can you be trusted to be away from your wife for five minutes? Can you be trusted to sit at home in a dark house for ten minutes? Can you be trusted? We certainly must be. Even so, we speak not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. Fathers must realize what has been entrusted to them. 
Your wife's soul, in principle, has been entrusted to you. Why would you talk to her like a dog? Why would you scream and yell and holler and belittle her? Why, if God has blessed you with children, how could you do them that way? How did Paul handle the gospel? Did he handle it deceitfully? He flat out said he did. Are you deceitful with your family? Shame on you. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. All of us should who've done those things. The responsibility of the souls of the wife and children falls to the father. Are you going to be faithful with it, men? We must keep our family safe from the schemes, from the wiles of Satan, of the devil. Who's that first line? Who's that first line of defense in keeping the home pure? Dad. We need faithful fathers. Faithful father is forbearing. Faithful father is attentive. Faithful father is trustworthy, number four. H, F-A-T-H, helpful. Helpful. What is helpful? It's promoting personal, social, and most importantly, spiritual well-being. Don't you know when something breaks? Who do you call? Uh, mom can, uh, no, you don't call mom. You call grandma. Hey, grandma. No, you don't call grandma, do you? Who do you call? You call your father. You call your dad. Dad, the toilet's broke. Dad, this is broke. Dad, there's this. Dad, there's that. And we realize the physical aspect, but let's go to the book of Acts. Acts 26. Must faithful fathers be helpful? Well, certainly. Does that mean you need to help your kids with their physical things? Well, sure, if you have the ability and the time, well, sure. But what are we focusing on? The spiritual things. We must be spiritually helpful to our wives, spiritually helpful to our children. Acts 26 is where we're going to be. The word help basically means to stand alongside, as we'll see it here used in the book of Acts. It means to aid, to extend assistance or relief. The book of Acts is the book of conversions. If you want to figure out how to be converted, start in Acts 1-1 and keep reading. You see, you'll see several cases of conversion. Add all those up and see what you come up with. Look at all those cases of conversion. Pile up the evidence and see what you come up with. Figure out what church they were added to. Figure out how they worshiped God in spirit and in truth. In Acts 21, here begins Paul's trials and imprisonments. But in Acts 26, we're going to look beginning in verse 19. Listen to what is said here. We're picking it up in the middle of the thought, but understand, faithful fathers must be helpful. Acts 26, 19, Where Paul, no king Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent. You see that? And turn to God. See that? And do works meet for repentance. Mess with that one. Verse 21. For these causes the Jews. What causes? For preaching. For these causes the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. Now that, that's a man standing right there and need help, isn't it? That's a man who needs some help. You realize there are times your wife's going to be in trouble and need help? Maybe not. She may not be about to die, but she might. You realize your children may get in such a mess sometimes they need some help. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Verse 22. Listen to what Paul said. His heavenly father did. Having therefore obtained, what did he get? Help. What does a faithful father do? Who is our example of a father? Our heavenly father, our father who art in heaven. What did he do with his child? Did he abandon him? Having therefore obtained help of God. Paul needed some help. And did he get it? He got it. I continue into this day. Paul could witness. Witnessing. He saw it. What have you seen? Nothing. Witnessing both to small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come, that Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. Do you realize God? It is our very present help. In trouble. God is our refuge and strength. 
a very present help in times of trouble. When you get in trouble, what do you need? You need some help. Fathers, are you going to help your children? Or are you going to write them off? Now, there may be a time where that has to happen. But I'd rather err on the side of mercy and compassion. I'd rather suffer long and forbear and try to help. Fathers must realize that their children stand in dire need of spiritual help. Do you realize that? If the commode floods over, it can get cleaned up. If the lawnmower dies and the grass grows up over your head, it'll be all right. You lose your soul and you're done. You're done. Faithful fathers must be helpful. In order to be helpful, you're going to have to be there. You're going to have to make the time. You're going to have to sacrifice something. You're going to have to back off something to help. Is it worth it? Well, only you can decide that. F, forbearing. A, attentive. T, trustworthy. H, helpful. E, number five, encourage you. Did your father encourage you? Did your father help build you up? Or did he belittle you? Did he scream and yell and holler at you? The word encouraging means having qualities which inspire hope. What is our hope if not heaven? If your father doesn't inspire you to go to heaven, who is? Me? I'll do my best, but I don't live with you. I don't raise your children. You do. You bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. You show them what a godly man is. You do it. I'll help, but it's your job, not mine. Let's go to the book of 2 Corinthians. It's a great day to be a dad, isn't it? <laughs> 2 Corinthians addresses some questions regarding Paul's authority as an apostle of Christ. And the book of 2 Corinthians, for example, 1 Corinthians shows problems but church problems. 2 Corinthians shows problems but Paul's problems. He suffered a lot. He went through a hard time. And when we look here in 2 Corinthians 2 verses 5 to 8, we need to have some background in regard to what happened. In 1 Corinthians 5, it seems there was a brother. It doesn't seem there was a brother who was a fornicator. He was a fornicator. And instead of the church saying, uh-uh, you can't do that, they just basically said, well, the, the only law is love. We need to love. Well, that, that, well, we need to love, but that's not the only law. A little leaven living at the whole lump. You got to handle that. Well, it seems that they followed through with Paul's instructions from 1 Corinthians and they withdrew from him. But then what happened? He repented. That was the whole point to withdraw from him was to cause him to repent. He repents and they say, no, 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 we done handled you. Well, you know what? There's a time to be encouraging. 2 Corinthians 2 beginning in verse 5. Let's see what the Bible says. But if any have caused grief, he hath not grieved me, but in part that I may not overcharge you all. Sufficient. Sufficient to such a man is this punishment. What punishment? They withdrew from him. Which was inflicted of many so that contrary wise, what ought you to do? The whole purpose behind withdrawing fellowship is to cause repentance. He got it. Now what do you do? You pick him up and encourage him. You had to whip him there for a while, but he stopped. Now what? There's a time, fathers, where you got to discipline your children. But then what? You pick them up. You dust them off. You encourage them and say, boys, let's don't do this again. It doesn't have to be this way, right? So the contrary wise, you ought rather to forgive him. And do what? Comfort him. Comfort means to give security, to free from pain, trouble, and worry. He's done what's right. Fathers, there are time your children do what's right. What do you do? Yeah. Yeah, you could do better. Man, encourage them. Help them. That you ought rather and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. You know you can push your children too far. You know you can push 
and push and push your children too far. Let me give you an easy illustration. You take a good dog and beat that dog and watch and see if that dog don't bite you. You understand that? You take a good dog, you be mean to that dog, you beat on that dog and watch and see if that dog don't turn around and bite you. You can push a good dog to where he'll bite you. What about a child? What about a child? What about your wife? And I don't necessarily mean lay teeth and chomp on you, but I mean rebel and run off. There's a time that we have to be encouraged. Wherefore, I beseech you, verse 8, that you would confirm your love toward him. I'm beseeching you that you confirm your love to your wife and to your children. Encourage them. Smile at them. Spend a little time with them. It's not that bad. We realize fathers must encourage their children to be better than the best. But that goal always has to be heaven. Are you fathers encouraging your children to go to heaven? Or are you encouraging them to make five dollars? Encouraging them to work? That's good. You need to work. We get so busy that we ain't faithful. We want faithful fathers. A faithful father. And our acrostic for father, forbearing, attentive, Trustworthy, helpful, encouraging. And number six, a faithful father is righteous. Did you know that? Let's go to the book of First John. First John. My view, First John, is the book of love. Especially chapter four. Read First John four and count all the times love or something like that is used. Look and see. And boy, John, I tell you another word that sticks out in the book of First John is no. K-N-O-W. John knew a whole lot. Well, you know. John knew that he was righteous. Righteous means one meeting the standard set by the Father in the New Testament. It is a person who is judicially right. The righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel of Jesus Christ, Romans 1, 16 and 17. The only way you'll be a faithful father is to be righteous. The only way you'll be righteous is to be in the gospel. The gospel is the New Testament from Matthew to Revelation. Let's look at 1 John 3 and verse number 7. 1 John 3, I would entitle children. Another significant thing about the book of John are the contrasts. There are children of light, children of darkness, children of God, children of the devil. Listen to what John says. 1 John 3, 7. Little children, that doesn't mean he was their father or called reverend holy father that's a term of endearment that shows how much he cared for them if he cared for them what about his family sometimes we care more about the church than we do our own family can't be cannot be little children let no man deceive you let no man deceive you now watch he that doeth keeps on doing righteousness is almost righteous is close to being righteous, is on the right path to being righteous. That's not what mine says. I don't know about what yours says. Mine says, he that doeth righteousness is righteous. You're right. Even as he, Christ, God the Father, whichever one you want to pick, is righteous. Do you realize, faithful fathers, we have to meet the standard of righteousness. We can go around the barn. We can beat around the bushes all we want. It's heaven and hell. It's heaven and hell. We got to get it right. Somebody has to do something at some time to say, wait, put the brakes on. My family's falling out of line. We're drifting apart. Somebody has to say, time out. Get back over here. Let's work this thing out. Let's talk about this. Let's work on it. In order to do that, we have to meet the standard of righteousness. Fathers must meet the New Testament standard of righteousness in order to go to heaven. Do you want to go to heaven? Do you want your wife to go to heaven? Do you want your children to go to heaven? Then you need to do something, men. And if there's no man in your life, women, you need to do something. You need to step up and handle this thing. Children, you need to listen very attentively and not pit mom and dad against each other and try to help this thing and go to heaven. Faithful father is forbearing, attentive, 
trustworthy, helpful, encouraging, and righteous. You need to tell your father how much you love and appreciate him. He won't be around forever. Now, in the flesh. He won't be around forever in the flesh. There will come a time where you won't see your daddy's physical face anymore. Some of you may already be there. If your father's alive, you need to spend a little time with him. You need to hug him, pat on him, tell him you love him. You need to do those kind of things because the day will come and it will always be sooner than you think. He'll be gone in the flesh, but his soul and spirit will continue on. You realize all these principles are necessary in order to be a faithful Christian. Are you a Christian? There are some people who say, I've been a Christian all my life. No, you haven't. No, you haven't. There are some people who say, I've been a member of the church all my life. No, you haven't. Somewhere along the line, you sinned. You abandoned God. You were mean and hateful and despicable to your father. Do you realize that? But God is so loving that he will accept you back. He'll take you back. He'll clean you up, forgive all that sin, and allow you to go to heaven. Isn't that something? That's beautiful. That's a lesson there for the fathers. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We must believe the truth. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10.17. Did you know that Romans 2.4 teaches that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? Did you realize that? Did you also realize that in Romans 10, 9, and 10, you must confess? What do you confess? You confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Believe, repent, confess. And in Romans 6, 1 to 4, you must be buried with Christ. Where did Christ shed his blood? He shed it at his death on the cross. Where do you meet the blood of Christ? In accordance with belief, repentance, and confession, scriptural baptism is where you wash clean. It's where you are reconciled back with your Father. What will you do? Brethren, be thou faithful unto death. Then you'll receive a crown of life. To the alien sinner, the gospel call is out. To the erring saint, you know what you need to do. Repent and pray. We're here to help you. Make your decision. As together we stand and as we sing the song of encouragement.